it was November, and I, I didn't even think about Thanksgiving at all. And so when it even came down time to talk about Thanksgiving, it was like, yeah, Thanksgiving just went by super fast. And so in order to curb that with uh, Christmas, I decided we're going to follow the Advent calendar in, in certain ways, uh, kind of very shortly over these next four weeks. We're, we're really going to focus on Advent. And I don't know if you've, you've probably heard of Advent, you've probably heard of what that is, but a- what Advent is all about, it's about recognizing the second coming of Christ. That kind of shocked me when, when I thought about it. Like, what do you mean the second coming of Christ? Advent is remembering that Christ is returning, that Christ is coming back. And so what we do is we talk a lot about the first coming of Christ, when he came as a baby, when he came as a child. And so these next four weeks, in, in this study of Advent, in this study of, of Christmas, uh, it's, it's not only going to be learning the reason for the season. It's going to be learning and going to be um, going over the coming of Christ. And not only the coming of Christ at the end of times and, and to wrap things up uh, in, in, his, in his final coming, but in the coming of his life um, and the coming of him into your life on a day-to-day basis. The fact that we have a Savior who is with us in all things. And when I realize many times when we go into this, this Christmas season, we get so caught up in gifts, and it's, it's good, it's not a bad thing. I, I, I hate making you feel guilty. I never want you to feel guilty about anything, really, because giving gifts is, is great. Um, I'm sure parents, you're, you're very excited as well as dreading the fact that you have to give gifts to your children, and you have to make sure you know what they want. Uh, I, I'm already dreading that. I dread that every year when it comes to family members. I have no idea what they want. I have no idea what gifts they want. And so this season becomes stressful. It becomes anxious. And so what I want to do with you here at church when we're talking about Christmas is I want to give you an opportunity to kind of relax. Don't worry so much about all the craziness of the holiday season. I know this is the busiest time of the year for for everyone. And so this is a time for us to really reflect on Christ. And so in regards to gifts, and today we're going to talk a lot about about gifts. We're going to talk a lot about what what that even entails uh, in terms of of an idea. But, but really, when it comes to gifts, when I was growing up, I loved Christmas so much, as many kids love Christmas, because you get gifts that you can play with and that you don't really have to have responsibilities. And I, I remember even as a kid, just enjoying the, the joys of waking up early in the morning and playing my Super Nintendo. And just sitting, sitting in front of the TV and playing hours on end without a care in the world. I know now uh, kids play with their Xboxes and their Playstations. And, and, and that's, that was like my escape. And so I loved Christmas because I knew like that next, that new console, that new game like that I've been waiting for for so long, like it's probably under the Christmas tree. And you would open it up and you would, you would play with it all day and your parents would yell, yell at you for playing with it. And it was, it was one of those things that it was, it was the irony of it. I would play so much video games and it's like they would, they would say, I'm going to take it away. And I would say back to them, but you're the one who gave it to me. So like, why? Like, why am I getting in trouble? But at the end of the day, um, learning about gifts as a child, you only learn one aspect of gifts. You learn that gifts are great. They're wonderful. As we get older, we learn that gifts come with certain responsibilities. I'm sure parents who have bought your kids a car, you, you want to explain to them very clearly that, yes, this is your car. You can drive it. You can go wherever you want. But there are rules attached. There are limitations that we put around this gift, not because we hate you, not because we want to ruin your life, but because as we give you this gift, we want to make sure that you use it in the best way. You understand it. You understand the purpose of it. I, I'm freaking out. I, I, in terms of when my kids grow up and I have to get them cars and they drive off, like I'm, I'm already anxious and so I'm, I'm re- going to really need your wisdom during those times when, when Emery's old and, and my son is old and they're, they're trying to do all that stuff. I can only imagine the anxiety of, of gift giving because in our gifts, you also want to teach a lesson to your, your kids in, in many ways. You want them to grow and to develop. I remember a specific story where where this kind of hits home. It was like the first time I realized that some gifts carry more responsibilities than others. I had been asking my dad for a dog for a very long time. 
And basically, well, we, my dad and I had been talking for a long time about getting a dog, and, and he's allergic to dogs. And so he was like, we need to get an, a dog that's going to live outside in a dog house um, that's, that's going to be outdoors. And we lived in California, so it wasn't like dog abuse. It wasn't anything bad. Um, they, they were going to be totally happy living out in the California sun and, and having their own dog house. And so my dad and I, we talked about getting a dog. We talked about about adopting one from the pound. We didn't need to get one from a breeder. We just were like, any dog works. And so my dad, being, and, and he's such a lovable guy, but being, being the guy he is, he goes to the pound without us, without the kids. And, and he's like, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring back a dog. And mind you, he didn't tell us when he was going to get the dog. He didn't tell us what kind of dog he was going to get. And he didn't tell my mom he was going to get the dog. So one day after work, uh, and so all the kids were at school, my mom was at home, she was cooking dinner, and I remember, I, I distinctly remember, he came in through the backyard, and we just heard barking, and we were like, yes, we got a dog, and we were so excited. We go outside, and to our amazement, when we looked outside, we, our jaws dropped. My dad brought home two dogs, and <laughs> These two dogs were a German Shepherd Labrador mix that he got from the pound. And we were like, we wanted one. You brought home two. Yes, this is the best. Like, this is the best day ever. Like, this is the best gift ever. And, of course, my mom, I, I'll never forget her face. Like, she was frozen. Like, I didn't even know you were going to get one dog. You brought home two dogs. And these weren't small dogs. I mean, they were puppies at the time. Like, they, were, they were tiny. But these were going to be... 60, 70 pound dogs when they're, when they're fully grown. And so two of them, like just her mind kind of blew up. But we were so excited. My dad explained, he's like, when I went to the pound, there was a super cute dog and we and wanted to get him, but he had, a, he had a sister. And so I had to adopt both. Like you can't, you can't just adopt one and leave, leave the sibling behind. And so he, he brought home both. And so we learned very quickly that the joy, the initial joy of the gift kind of goes away when you realize how much poop they have, <laughs> how much damage they, they, they cause. We had this really nice deck outside, um, and, and the dog scratched up the entire deck. And it, it, it was one of these things where I, my parents were just like, what have we done? The amount of um, just, just damage they did to our fences. Um, we, had, we had these really high fences, and they would jump over the fences. These dogs were insane. They were crazy. And so um, it even came to a point where my dad would walk the dogs, and they, they ran off so hard. They weren't very well trained. Again, this is another point to the message. Um, they weren't very well trained, and so they would shoot off, and my dad actually broke his wrist because two dogs that were incredibly athletic pulling my dad he just ate it, and, and he, I remember he came home, and he didn't really, he felt embarrassed, and he didn't want to tell anyone, but he's like, um, I think I broke my arm. And, and we were like, yeah, Dad, you broke your arm. Like, this is crazy. These dogs are insane, but we loved them so much. In many ways, and again, this analogy kind of falls short in a lot of ways, but in many ways, we come to an understanding with God when it comes to answered prayer, when it comes to Him giving us gifts that we have this immature response to answered prayer and to blessings. That we simply say, thank you, God, so much for the blessings. Thank you so much for the gifts that you're giving me. Thank you, thank you, thank you, initially. And then what we eventually learn is that, yes, God's gift was good. It was amazing. God's answer to your pray prayer was perfect, and it was right. It was good but it comes at a cost. That there's responsibility attached. There's a level of maturity that we need to have. That there's a way in which we steward this gift appropriately. And there's a way that we do it inappropriately. And that we can easily turn a gift into a curse. And so when we pray to God, when we pray unto him, we have to recognize that our God is a good and loving father who wants to answer your prayers, who wants to give you the gifts that you desire. But we have to know, we have to remember that it doesn't just end with the giving of the gift, that we have to steward it, we have to take care of it, we have to raise it, we have to use it properly because there's a way in which we use it improperly. Before I lose you, I really feel that the story of Mary fits this understanding of answered prayer very well. So if you would open your Bibles with me to Luke chapter 1, 
starting from verse 46. This is called the Magnificat because this is an amazing prayer. This is a prayer that, that is so, it's so good. When we went through our sermon series in prayer, I really wanted to go over this, but then I realized that it's probably better for us to, to do it at a, at a different time like Christmas. But this prayer is very similar to Hannah's prayer. When we went over our sermon series, we went over Hannah's prayer where she was praying for a child and God grants her her request and she becomes pregnant and, and just how much joy there is in Hannah and she just gives thanksgiving unto God. Mary's prayer is very similar to Hannah's prayer. But it's different. It's in response to not her just bearing a child. It's her response to bearing the Savior. And, and this is, is really a, 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 a prayer that I want to read to you and just for us to, to meditate on today. So Luke chapter 1, starting from verse 46. It says, And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked on the humble estate of his servant, it's, it's important to understand that, he, that she understands that she's in a humble estate. For behold, from now on all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his offspring forever. I love, I love this prayer, because it's so heartfelt. It's such an amazing response from Mary unto her Lord, unto God who answered her prayer. And the funny thing is, is we don't know exactly what, what Mary prayed in order to receive the amazing blessing, the, the responsibility of bearing Christ. But I could imagine what it would be. I could imagine that Mary asked God, she said, Lord, use me. I, I can imagine Mary praying to God and saying, Lord, in whatever way you want, use me because I am your humble servant. Use me in however you choose. And the, the thing about that is, is I've, I've prayed that same prayer to God, saying, Lord, use me. I want to be used by you. And the thing is, God's like, you sure? You, sh you sure you want to be used by me? And Mary's like, yes, I want to be used by you. And God looks at her and says, okay, you're going to bear the Savior of the world. You are going to be mother to a son that's going to save all of humanity. So when Mary hears this, she prays this. She prays a prayer that says, Lord, thank you for answering my prayer. Thank you for using a humble servant like me. Thank you for, for bringing me this opportunity to bear the Savior of the world. And yes, this gift came even at a cost right then and there. She wasn't married. And so there would be all this stigma around her. Uh, it, it was to a point where even Joseph considered divorcing her because he was, he was thinking how shameful it was. And then an angel comes and visits Joseph and tells him, no, it's the savior of the world that is in, that is in your future wife. And so Joseph's like, all right, I got to marry her. But in, in all of this, Mary, despite all of the stigma, despite all the taboo, ta taboo that, that revolves around her being pregnant and still a virgin, looks at God and says, thank you for using me. Thank you for giving me this gift. I'm going to be remembered among all generations. And the thing is, is in her prayer, and we need to remember this, in her prayer of thanksgiving, God is faithful, and God did exactly what she prayed for. In, in her prayer, God shows his character, but also shows that she is remembered throughout all generations. It's, it's amazing to me how, how high of honor we give Mary because of the fact she was such a humble servant. And what we see even with our Catholic brothers and sisters is that they put Mary on, on an even different level. And as Protestants, we don't necessarily agree with that, but I understand the heart of that. Is that Mary, even in this prayer, is explaining, she understands the, the responsibility of this gift. She understands the importance of this event. But what I want us to remember is that the story and her prayer 
doesn't end here. And that's really what I want to focus on. As beautiful as this prayer is, and as true as it is, I can only imagine Mary's frustration. I can only imagine her disappointment. I can only imagine the missed expectations she had regarding the Savior. We have to remember the way in which the Jews, the, the, the Hebrews, the Israelites viewed the Savior was that they believed he would be a king. He would be a conqueror. He would be one to come in and destroy all of Israel's enemies and put the Jews back on top. That, that, that's what they believed. And when Jesus was entering into Jerusalem, that's why we have Palm Sunday, where they laid down the palms and they said, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, is because they thought, okay, this is the time that Jesus, instead of doing all these weird miracles on the side fringes around the suburbs of Jerusalem, he's coming into Jerusalem, into the city, and now he's going to overthrow the Romans. He's going he's gonna to overthrow those people that have, been, that have been just totally oppressing us and causing us to pay all these taxes, not allowing us to worship the way we want to worship. Now, the Savior is here. And they had all these expectations about what the Savior was going to be, what the Savior was going to look like, that when he didn't meet their expectations, they killed him. They, they sent him to die. A horrific death because of those mixed expectations. And when I read stories like that of their expectations being so horribly missed, and I look at Mary in this time where she's pregnant with the baby Jesus, I wonder what her expectations were. I wonder what she thought about the child in her belly. I have to think, there, there probably was a part of her that w- w- probably even wondered, is this baby even going to be a normal baby? Like when I give birth, is it, is, am I going to give birth to like a grown man? Because, because then God will, will, will become manifest right away and then Jesus right then and there will become king and, and enter into our world in a magnificent way. I, I could imagine she even had that thought. Because the idea of our Savior, the idea of God, incarnate, coming down in the form of a baby, in swaddling cloths, in a, in a manger, basically like a, like a cave. Like the idea of that probably messed with Mary's head a little bit. She probably wasn't thinking, oh yeah, I'm pregnant with the Lord of all creation. I'm, I'm pregnant with the Prince of Peace. I'm probably going to give birth in a cave. She probably wasn't thinking that. She was probably thinking, if anything, I, I, I'll probably give birth in, in like the temple courts. I'll probably give birth in somewhere very important. But I think what she was realizing even through her pregnancy was, man, maybe this is going to be a little bit different than what I had originally even thought when I was praying this prayer. Imagine when Jesus is, is born and he's this crying baby. And, and she has to feed feed Jesus in the middle of the night every two hours, every three hours, just constantly having to wake up in, in, her, in her grogginess and her tiredness and probably feeding Jesus and being like, you're the savior of the world? That when Jesus starts to grow up and becomes a teenager and he's talking with the people in the temple and he's telling them things that don't fit their paradigm, that, that is, is shaking and rocking their world, their understanding of God, and he's causing all this ruckus and people are looking at Jesus and, and, and already starting to talk bad about him. I can imagine Mary feeling that, 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 that frustration. Jesus, just, just come on, stop. Stop making such a scene. Stop rustling so many feathers. You know, just, just be quiet. I can imagine that as Jesus gets older and as he just shows that he is perfect, that he is loving, he is kind, that, that Mary is probably just thinking, like, yeah, you're the Savior. And I know, I remember God telling me when I was a young woman that you're the Savior of the world. <sighs> but you're like 30 now? Like, what are you going to do with your life? Like, imagine if Mary is, is really thinking in the way that we think, and it's like, Jesus, you're 30 years old, you're still living at home, you haven't even done anything with your life, like, shouldn't you become a doctor or something? You know, you're, you're, you're God, like, you know everything, so, so why are you still here at age 30? And then even when Jesus goes into ministry, imagine all the persecution, all the terrible things people are saying about Jesus, the Pharisees, the leaders of the religion, 
the people who are there just talking bad about her son, about this gift that God has given her. And imagine when she's at the foot of the cross, looking up and seeing her son, the promised gift of Christmas, the promised child that was meant to rule and save the world, that when she's looking up at the cross, I can only imagine the thoughts that are going through her head. Lord, you failed me. God, you answered my prayer and you made me your servant, but you're cruel. You're mean. How, how could you take away this gift from me? My son, how could you let my son live a life of pain and of suffering when I love him so much, when I cared for him so much, that I've known this Jesus since he was a baby. I've known him since he was a child. I've seen him develop and grow up. That as she's at the foot of the cross, looking up at a beaten and broken and bloody Jesus, that she must be wondering, why did I pray this prayer? Why did I give God thanks for using me as his servant? Why did I give God thanks for giving me this gift? There's only pain and suffering that comes with this gift. There's only extra responsibility. There's only frustration. I thought that I was going to bear the child that was going to save the world, but he's dying there on a cross. Church, this is how in many ways when God blesses you, we end up feeling. When God gives us what we want so badly, when we pray really hard about whatever it is, whatever it is that you are so, so desiring, and when God gives it to you, we have the same attitude as Mary. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for answering my prayer. Hallelujah. My, my prayers are answered. My life is good. My life is perfect. My life is complete now. See, Mary, when she's at the foot of the cross, she's no longer thinking. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My life is complete. When Mary's at the foot of the cross, she's thinking, how could you? How dare you take this away from me? Her heart must have been broken into a million pieces. But the way that God works, the amazing thing about God's gift is that even when we lose it, even when we think we lose it, God has an even better gift for us. And see, I, again, w wish I was there when the resurrected Christ after three days, he rises again from dead and reveals himself to the people that know him. The, the expression on Mary's face. The expression on his mother's face. Knowing, knowing without a shadow of a doubt that God did keep his promise. That God did do what he said he was going to do. That he did give her the gift that he promised. That he did give her the Savior of the world. That she is the mother of the Savior of the world. That as she sees the resurrected Christ, she probably was thinking, Oh my goodness, God, you are so good. You are able to raise the dead back to life. What was lost is now found. And now I can rejoice in you even more. And so she again has that attitude back to when she first had the call. First was told that she would bear the Savior of the world. One of thanksgiving and joy. This correlates to us. Some of us in this room are praying for prosperity. You're praying for success. You're praying for riches and wealth and comfort and, and the joys of life. And I'm not here to say that's wrong to pray for. I'm not. I'm not here to say, if you're praying every day and saying, Lord, please bless me financially. Bless me so that I, I become rich, that I become strong, that I'm healthy, that I'm able to, to live the life to the fullest. That's not wrong. But there's a, there's a common saying, be careful what you wish for. And I don't like thinking of it, of prayers as wishes, but there's, there's a saying now, just be careful what you pray for. Because I know the God that we serve, that he does answer our prayers. And in many ways, in our immaturity, when we receive that answered prayer, the same way that Mary received the answered prayer that she had, and when God gives you a gift, it's not as simple as him just giving you the gift. That he wants us to steward it. He wants us to raise it. 
He wants us to even get to a point where if that gift goes away, that if that gift is gone, that we know that there is a God in heaven and that he can resurrect it back from the dead. And so this is the call to be very careful in the way in which we we handle the, the answered prayer of God. Because it's not simply saying, no, 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 it's okay, I don't want it. No, no, it's okay. I, I, I don't want that responsibility on me. No, thank you, God. I don't want your gifts. That wasn't Mary's response to when, when God said, okay, I'm going to answer your prayer and I'm going to give you this amazing gift of the Savior of the world. Mary was like, oh, no, thank you. Okay, she said, thank you. She said, thank you so much for this. And so when God does bless you, and whether it's with money, whether it's with a family, whether it's with a spouse, whether it's with children, whether it's with a promotion, whether, regardless of what, what, with what it is, when God blesses you, the response needs to be, it must be thankfulness right away. But there needs to be an understanding behind the thankfulness. He said, yeah, God gives you that great promotion. He gives you that pay raise. He gives you that, that, beautiful, that beautiful girlfriend, that, that, that spouse, that, that amazing husband, that amazing family, that picture-perfect Thanksgiving, that everything is wonderful and happy and perfect, that it, the gift doesn't end there. The story of our salvation doesn't end in a manger. The story of our salvation actually begins on the cross where it's bloody, broken, battered. And that's the moment where we look back at our marriages and we say, when I got married to you, I was so thankful to God. But right now, our marriage looks bloody and battered. So again, this is the time where we go back to God and we say, Lord, what's going on? Lord, what's going on? This gift This marriage you've given me, this child you've given me, this relationship you put me in, this job that you put me in, this success that you've given me. In the beginning, it was so great. It was so wonderful. But now all I see is blood and pain and tears. What are you doing? All I'm saying is is that the God that we serve and the gifts that he gives, it doesn't end in death, but it ends in life. So if you're sitting here today and and you are experiencing the blessings of God, I'm telling you, that's great. That's wonderful. Thank God. Give him all the things and steward it in the best way possible. Raise that gift. Develop and nurture that gift to the best of your ability to serve God, to give it unto God, back unto God. Don't lord over it. It's not yours. It's all belonging to him. Or if you're at the foot of the cross and your gift that God has given you is just not that great anymore. If your marriage is falling apart, if your kids are rebelling, if, if your job is just toxic, pray unto God that the Lord that we serve, the Christ that we serve, has the power to raise the dead back to life. And so I, I proclaim this in the name of Jesus, that God can answer your prayers because he answered Christ's prayers. He answered Mary's prayers. He showed us his power, that the gifts that, he give to, that, he, that he's giving to us, that he has given to us, is not for your destruction, but it's for your development. Church, your marriages, it's not too late. Your families, it's not too late. It's not too far gone. We can always come back to the power of Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for what you're doing in our lives. We thank you for giving us an opportunity, a time to to know that the gifts you give us are great. They're wonderful. And yes, they come with so much responsibility. And Lord, that many times we become too attached to those gifts. And so when we lose those gifts, we lose hope in you. But I pray we would never lose hope and faith in you. That we would know that Jesus is alive and well. That he is ruling and reigning in heaven. Father, I pray for this congregation that whatever prayers that they have, whatever things that they are praying about and praying for, that they would pray with boldness. But Lord, as you respond and answer their prayers and give them and, and, and give them these blessings, I pray that they would steward them in a way that is pleasing unto you, Lord. And Father, I pray that if they ever lose those gifts, God, if those gifts seem to be broken and lost, Lord, that you would revive it. You would resurrect it. 
not for their glory, but for yours. We love you. We thank you. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.